so we goyle have uh welcome back to another day at goyle have i'm gonna have to find something new to say there because i always say the same thing <laughs> and i'm gonna have to like come up with a few variations on it. <laughs> Um, today with me I have Polly Barton um, returning um, from her first appearance at Goyle last year. Um, thank you so much Polly for coming. Thank you for having me. Oh no it was you know I was like well, who was, who's gonna come this year <laughs> like there were a few people at that top of the list that were easy yeah, ones. That's difficult that's really difficult. Um, it feels weird to me that it's been a year honestly like same. you know who would have thought but, but anyway, here we I are. Watched, I watched the video in like preparation for um, today and I was like, oh, oh, like, was that really like that? <laughs> just sort of, I felt like I was still very much that same person. I didn't feel a year older. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. And yet it also, you know, if, if you'd said to me that was five years ago, I could also believe that. It's that weird soupy quality that time has kind of taken on, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Polly is a translator and also now a writer. Um, her debut book is Fifty Sounds, published by Fitzcarraldo Editions. Um, and when I sort of heard about Fifty Sounds and then subsequently read it, I had this feeling of like, but this is this is what the interview was like supposed to be like. This book is like everything sort of to do with translating and um, uh, thinking about language that like I wanted to sort of get to. And this is like the physical much better edition than our, than my interview last year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it like that for what it's worth but <laughs> <laughs> there are all sorts of things that suddenly come up like sort of being like um asked you know why Japanese or like um what sort of like do you feel fluent and all these sorts of questions and I was like ah <laughs> this is Polly's <laughs> way of <laughs> answering all those questions without <laughs> so um, a little bit to start with, would you mind talking a little bit about the concept of 50 sound and also in particular about onomatopoeia in Japanese, um, which I just, I'm quite in love with onomatopoeia anyway. Um, I do a bit of tutoring and I always like, so I just, the idea that it's in Japanese in such a more expansive way. Yeah, so yeah absolutely. Um... I'm always, you know, I'm a bit wary. I'm always still wary when I talk about the concept for this book, because I think it's really easy to make it sound absurdly complex and kind of arcane, which, you know, it, it is in a way, but it, my aim is for it not to read that way. So 50 sounds is a, a, di a direct, a transliteration of the Japanese word for their um, syllabary, which is like the phonetic alphabet. Um, and it's also used in the same way that we use like the ABC of something or, or whatever it's used as a concept to mean kind of every, every sound that exists. Um, and so I've kind of taken this as a word, as an idea and kind of run with it. So this book is I guess an essay in 50 essays in a way it's um 50 semi-discrete entries of a kind of personal dictionary and each one of those entries is based around a um onomatopoeic word um so the the kind of the chapter titles all take the same form which is this one onomatopoeic word followed by a extremely subjective definition that kind of relates to my experiences or perceptions you know surrounding that word and 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 you know makes no claim to be objective or like give a give a proper definition in, in any sense of the word sorry strange bleeping noise coming from I'm not sure what um and yes so onomatopoeia in Japanese um so Japanese is very rich in onomatopoeic language. Um, second, the, there's kind of lots of debates on this, but it's thought to be second in the world after Korean. Um, so it has like a bit, you know, how it's assessed, that how you assess whether or not a word is onomatopoeic or not varies. And so estimations vary, but it's at least three to five 
times more than in any Indo-European language, so a lot. Um, and what's what I find kind of interesting talking, you know, about the overlap with English. I mean, in English, when we say onomatopoeia, we mean usually kind of very straightforward onomatopoeia, like splash or pop, you know, a word that is describing a sound um, in, a, in some symbolic way, um, sound symbolic way. And, but then there are also words which are describing non-audible phenomena, which, but which kind of sound symbolically are evocative of that state. So something like trudge or dash, or, you know, there are lots and lots and lots of these words in English. And it's much more, it's a, you know, a real sliding scale. And I could talk to one person and they would say, oh no, they're on a matter definitely. And then another, and they would say, no, no way. They're just regular verbs, you know? Um, whereas in Japanese and Korean, as far as I understand it, it the boundaries are much, clearer so there's you know a real very clear sense from almost all of these words of, of, of whether or not they are mimetic M mimetic being the word that kind of encompasses those directly onomatopoeic words and then words describing a state or a non-audible state um and sorry this is being a very long answer but just fi finally um the, the reason that I was so interested in these onomatopoeic words is because I feel like they have this very um, somatic, visceral kind of effective quality to them. Um, and they're often accompanied by gestures. Um, and sort of after a while, they came to me to like symbolize this, this idea about language or language learning, which was what I wanted to get across in this book, which is kind of <laughs> like positioning itself in opposition to the, the textbook, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And you do something that I really admire in writing and sort of I think is deceptively difficult um, when you do write, which is weave lots of different types of writing together. So your sort of essay entries um, are in chronological order um, and they are sort of going through your life. It sort of makes sense you know, um, to sort of go through them in that way. Um, and they're also weaving together sort of personal essay, um, phil phil philosophical essays, a little bit of Wich Wittgenstein um, and a little bit of sort of other um, philosophy underpinnings of language. And then also with these sort of personal anecdotes and then that's interviewed. And I know that actually, um, at some points, I'm imagining that must have looked quite ugly um, when they were a little bit less woven together. Um, so I wondered if you want to talk about how you pulled in these different threads and whether they were all always there or whether they evolved as your sort of idea of the book evolved. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I that's the kind of writing that I admire and have admired and you know in, ex in to the extent that this book has like direct influences I think it's from people who I have read and felt that do that really well and the feeling for me when reading that kind of writing you know so like when I read Maggie Nelson for the first time for example was like this feeling not just of like wow that's amazing but like this is what I've always wanted to do somewhere but not known that that was allowed. Um, and so in Kate Briggs's this little art is sort of similar in, I mean, it, 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 yeah, it's different to Mackinac, obviously, but sort of the, the, you know, the seamless merging of different um, kinds of writing. Um, but it is hard. I, I, I did find it hard and ugly and those choices, are really difficult um and you know I think we've reached a point where to a certain extent like the essay has become a formula in to a certain extent and and there is a you know th this 
this sense of like blending the personal with the critical and so you know you write a bit about something bad that happened to you and then you drop in a bit of Deleuze or whatever and I like I, obviously when that's done well it, it's great but I, that also was something that I I wanted to avoid I wanted to kind of really step away from the format of it and just be exploring exactly what I wanted to explore I suppose um and I think I think ultimately the the format of it the 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 50 sounds structure and having that constraint was really helpful you know because it sort of allowed me to have one part that was just very, um, you know, like full on prose poem type writing. And then the next, immediately, the next one that had one that was engaging principally with like critical theory. I mean, <laughs> I say that it makes it sound more academic than it is, but like, you know, the, the, la the ideas informing it. Um, so I think that was really, that was really helpful in, in the sense of like, it, it, I was sort of defining it to myself as like a dictionary and so it, there didn't need to be internal coherence as long as kind of overall there was a, a sense of a through line I suppose. Yeah I actually think there is an element I mean do if you don't see it this way like do you know um, I guess I saw an element of academic writing in there um, in a way that I quite like where I think often good academia particularly in social sciences wouldn't like to speak for <laughs> any other field um does bring together really different things that maybe haven't um necessarily been brought together um before I did um yeah it's funny that you know I think when I was writing it I I really didn't feel like tonally it was academic at all and then coming back to it, it's like, oh no, there are bits, there are bits that are quite kind of, I do slip into, you know, it is quite, it's more academic than I kind of mm. intended. Um, I think I think in a good way, I think more in a like, I recognise the structures from, mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. if I feel like if I hadn't had the sort of experience of having studied like philosophy and gone to university, then maybe I wouldn't maybe I wouldn't so closely associate those structures they're just there and yeah yeah, yeah. Um, how did you pick the definitions were there sort of was like um so there's sort of 50 sounds in there um but how did you how did you pick the 50 sounds and then also the definitions and um, did they come before or after writing the essay they're not um in case anyone hasn't picked it up yet they're not um the definitions you are going to find in another dictionary um so sort of how did they how did you get to the final definition you include yeah um Choosing the sounds was, you know, I mean, choosing the sounds was basically like working out how to structure the book. And there were some that I knew pretty much from the beginning that I wanted to include. Um, but others that shifted a lot during the course of writing, both in terms of whether or not to include, which ones I'd include, and also where they would appear. Um, you know, I, I think maybe it's worth saying that, like, the way that the particular chapters relate to those, relate to the words is very, there's no one way that they do that. And so some of them, it was, you know, like, very clear of like, okay, there's this word that I remember learning in this particular context, and like, the chapter is going to be about that. And others, it's far more I was going to say tenuous. I don't think it is. I hope that it's not tenuous, but the link is more of a conceptual one or an, you know, an association. Um, and yeah, th there were a couple which were more kind of like, I mean, in the end, I think I tried in the drafting process to do a couple where it, it, the link really was quite tenuous and I wanted to get this concept in and I'm using this word and it, it 
essentially felt too forced and so I got rid of those um so I think you know I achieved a point where they all like the link felt natural enough to me um but sometimes un unearthing that took a, a bit of time um in terms of the definitions I think they mostly came either during or after writing the chapters or like I do one bit and then like add another bit um there's only one actually where I directly just quote from a Japanese English onomatopoeic dictionary um yeah and and some of them yeah some of them are to totally um wacky I read a review of a blog post by someone who said he'd read this with a, or like his Japanese friend had been around when he was reading the contents page and he was kind of reading the definitions to his Japanese friend and this Japanese friend and saying yes or no of whether he felt like they, <laughs> they corresponded that like really was like oh god because <laughs> my my impression my feeling is that it would probably be like no 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 <laughs> so um what I'm hearing then is maybe a way of describing it is that the um the writing came first and then the definitions were you summarizing what you then had found uh, like a, either about yourself or in the writing um yeah um the the thing that really I felt a lot of um I don't know if it's familiarity or like kinship to the book I think I'm at a similar age as you were in some parts of the book and there is a lot of um things um, I want to ask a question about moving between countries um, a bit later. So what I want to focus on, but one of the reasons for that sort of familiarity is the shame that sort of runs through, because it's very much you are the narrator. And in the way that we all, um, you know, shame, um, the way I always, <laughs> the way I like try and remind myself is that shame is such a powerful emotion because it was so important, like evolutionary evolutionarily um, and that sort of you had to remember not to do something that you were ostracized for um, and sort of that that's why it's got such a, a powerful um, feeling still in our like physical bodies um, and I do think that you know shame comes up again and again and again um, throughout the different moments of this book um, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that yeah Absolutely. Thank you for recognizing that. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally fascinating, fascinated and obsessed by shame. Um, but actually, oddly, have not thought about it that much from an evolutionary perspective. So I'm going to have to go into that. I've read quite a lot of like, you know, Brene Brown and all of that stuff about it. Um, and and I think that it is one of the big factors motivating a lot of my thoughts and feelings. I mean, feelings about everything, life, you know, it's a, it's a big thing. It's been a big thing for me, um, but also specifically with reference to learning language. And I think, you know, that there's a really big part of me that suspects that the reason that I decided to learn Japanese was because I couldn't bear that feeling of <laughs> shame of not being able to speak you know and, and obviously like the, the sense of like the, the more rational thing to do then is not learn it at all or to, to go home um but I didn't do that I kind of kept on trying and, and there, therefore you know was continually exposed to shame and, and sometimes managed to find um, yeah, circumnavigate it. And so that was going on. I think, you know, one of the reasons that I'm really fascinated by shame as well is because I think it's still so hard to name and so hard to talk about. And actually, you know, Brene Brown talking about this is brilliant. And when she says like, oh, she's on an airplane and like the best, the best way to get the person next to her who's talking to her to shut up is 
to tell her tell them what she does you know when she says like oh I research shame it's like right <laughs> and the person doesn't speak to her the rest of the flight and I like I find that so amazing because it's you know we all I think we all have a really um complex relationship to it and it motivates so much of human behavior and yet I think we're so kind of cautious about naming it and I think that was also something you know in this book like I think I'm really glad that you picked up that it's like always there in the background but I think probably I don't use the word maybe I'm wrong in this but I don't think I used the actual word that much you know because I was aware I was not wanting to be like right shame 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 <laughs> um but yeah it's um I think one of the reasons it stands out as well is because if you are a child learning the language, you escape shame because you're not supposed to know this. Whereas as an adult learning the language, it's full of shame because you're used to communicating and you're used to moving through the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that, was, that was so fascinating to me when I went to Japan of like, you know, I was 21. I, thought of myself as an adult I think looking back now I wasn't an adult but I, you know certainly like in some ways I was a fully functioning human being and yet not just linguistically but you know culturally as well I you know I went out to Japan knowing nothing really about the language or of the language or about the culture and so I was also a, a, a baby you know an, an infant and like I think it was difficult for me to orient myself in that space. And I think it was also really difficult for, for people out there to know what to do with this person who like in some ways was so competent and in other ways was, you know, less competent than their three-year-old child or whatever. And that, yeah, so, I, and that often felt shameful. Um, mm. Yeah, although I, I mean, I say that and I think it did feel shameful, but it, what's interesting to me is like it, the shame only creeps in after a certain point. I think at the very beginning, it's like so, I knew so little that it, it yeah, it was only once I started to take kind of baby steps with it. Yeah. I always feel like the structure of the book is a little bit like, um, you know, um, going from childhood to teenage period to an adult at the end there's definitely also a period of like teenage angst in there yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah um sort of picking up on that like stuff about childhood and babyhood and there's authenticity and we talk about in the book how there's an authenticity to being a very basic speaker which is basically that you don't have the tools to manipulate um language in the way that we all learn <laughs> as we become fluent and can then alter and um or try and change how we're perceived and um, based on how we want to be perceived rather than what we're actually doing um do you want to talk on authenticity and being yeah. a big I mean, that was fascinating to me because it was just something that I had not envisaged would happen at all, you know? And I think I was coming straight from university when I didn't have that great time. I was kind of at the peak of like feeling extremely self-conscious. And I felt like I, you know, this, this real like, everything that anyone said was cloaked in seven seven layers of irony and you know you had to like it was kind of frowned upon in a sense no one would have articulated this but this was how it felt like to be genuine or earnest about anything because that made you uncool right um and and I think suddenly moving to this context where it was like the joy of just being able to put together a simple expression of how you're feeling after you know studying all morning to be able to say it was so extreme and it was like that that is enough and and I think also the way that you know it wasn't just me speaking Japanese like the, the conversations that I would have in English with Japanese people also like there were not these layers of um artifice I suppose and manipulation I, yeah I think that's a really great word um 
and and it was actually really clear to me in that as well like how much more enjoyable it was just to communicate without having to worry about constantly like what was being read into your words and yeah so I think yeah I talk a bit in the book about the, this sort of like feeling like you've become Yoda and like that actually you know it's sort of taken you to a like a, <laughs> a higher level in some way and it, it like that that was how it felt. Um, Do you think there was something coming from sort of a university to that that sort of actually you've like come from this place where you're expected to have quite developed layers in a particular style um yeah yeah and um, so as sort of like you know I'm not saying this is your original idea and um, but you definitely explore throughout the book um how language shapes us and I'm quite a big um you know proponent of this sort of if you don't have the vocabulary to describe something then you never understand that and you can't like voice it you can't even think it um and you sort of talk about how um also there you can be like a different person in a different language and the extent to which that is true um can be quite surprising and um a bit shattering of sort of lots of ways we do think about um personal identity yeah, yeah there's some so this is i suppose one of the slightly more academic chapters because i found this amazing research actually through twitter where all good academic discoveries take place um about like multiple multiple personalities through language and sort of a study that was done um actually of Japanese women living in the Bay area um and kind of conversations that they had same conversations were had in English and Japanese and questions being asked like what do you want to be when you are older you, you know, or I've got it. I've got it. Um, uh, uh, I will probably become in Japanese a housewife, in English a teacher. Um, real friends should in Japanese help each other. In English, be very frank. Exactly. So sorry. Yes, it wasn't questions. It was a sentence completion for exercise, and I I found that really shattering. To my perception, you know, I think I before seeing that exercise, I was very inclined to believe that there would be like slight modifications in how you presented yourself. But I think, you know, to, to that extent of like just giving a totally different answer of, of, of what of things pertaining to like your values or that or 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 kind of what we see as core beliefs, right? I think, you know, we tend to regard these, this, this again comes down to a kind of Wittgenstein thing, but you know, I think we tend to regard this idea of like what you want to be or what you think about something as like this internal, personal, fully formed thing that we use language to kind of express. And later Wittgenstein kind of exploded this idea, right? And it's like, no, the, the, the social, practices and what you see other people saying shape what you are you know saying that you think um and um yeah so I think I found that really shocking but also quite comforting as well because I had experienced myself that as I started to speak better Japanese like that feeling of being quite a different person, either in the way that I noticed or the way that was pointed out to me. And, and that feeling not exactly outside of my control, because I don't even know if I was aware of it happening. It was sort of only when it was only afterwards, it's like, oh, oh yeah, okay, that is maybe not at all what I would have said if I was having that conversation in English or, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is there, um, not to you know um if, if you don't want to answer like please don't but uh, 
what do those two versions of you feel like what does what does the um english one um have or lack that the japanese one has or lacks I mean, I think they are closer together now. Um, and I think I also, you know, to a certain extent, I feel like I can't talk about it with, like, without referencing the resources that I have, because I think, you know, I have a university education in English and and I also have like <laughs> the ability to make jokes to a certain degree when I want to. Um, <laughs> whereas, you know, neither of those, like, which are, you know, both ways of sort of, I, I mean, to like come out and say asserting social power, right? And like, you know, signaling things about yourself, which I don't have in Japanese. I mean, I, so I think, um, like, the thing that has been said to me several times by people that, I know it's like you're much softer and cuter in Japanese and I think and, and then sometimes the, the addition to that is and you're scary in English I mean I don't think it's always been particularly scary but maybe in comparison I have to. Um, I mean another big one is I think I'm much more deferential in Japanese um, that's also, yeah, that, that's very much tied in with. You, you explore. Yeah. You explore that quite a bit in the book and the and you know deference definitely comes with a discussion of gender and also then sort of discussion of gender naturally leads to sort of how you treat um sex and relationships in the book um I'm a really big fan of something very technically obvious that you did, which is give everybody a um, just an initial who are these people that you interact with or how partnered with for various sorts of times. Really enjoyed that. And I also really enjoyed <laughs> the way it was such a, a neat solution. Like it would have been so you know wrong to have their real names in there. And then also changing a name isn't nice either. And I, I really like that and I thought in general the way those relationships played out um was quite respectful of them whilst always being actually quite in interrogational as well like you know um sort of I like the way they faded in and out without sort of uh, defining although they may have defined like a period of time you had they weren't like defining in the way that um when uh, society quite likes to define women <laughs> by their relationships. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? And maybe then also how the deferential plays into gender and sex. Yeah. Um, thank you for saying that. I, you know, it's really interesting to me that The, the way that I, I think they do fade in and fade out and I describe sort of the bare I suppose the bare minimum I think of these people in order to like define give a sense of the relationship and its importance but I think my focus was really not on giving a kind of full portrait of these people in a way that I suppose is the, the, the initial is quite a good symbol of that as in like there's enough to sort of define their place but they are they're not placeholders to me but I think in the book to a certain extent they are placeholders and what I'm kind of interested by is like I was talking to someone the other day and they said oh there's very very little physical description of people in the book. And I kind of thought on that and I was like, yeah, that, that is true. And it, it sort of made me realize that probably that's for me like a category thing in some way. And probably if I had been thinking to myself, I am writing fiction, even if it was auto fiction, you know, if this 
book had a blue cover, I knew it was going to have a blue cover rather than a white one. I would have felt whether or not I wanted to, like I had to put physical descriptions in there. And and actually kind of in reverse, like with with memoir, or I don't know, whatever you call this, I, I still don't have a label for it, non-fiction essay, it didn't feel appropriate to do too much physical description, also because of, you know, they are real people and they do exist, and I want to kind of honor their privacy um, to the extent that that's possible. Um, I, I don't know what to say exactly about difference, but what, what I will say about gender is that, you know, I mean, I talk quite openly about sex in this book, right? The, the sex that I personally have had. And I think that that felt like quite a scary thing to do, but also one that I really felt that I needed to do, and I needed to do it because I am a woman. And, and it felt like I read the sort of the opposite account many times, or, 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 or not, like maybe, maybe not in such detail, but it's, you know, this sense that kind of a man can, do what he wants in the kind of sexual conquest realm and it, it basically leaves no sort of trace on his reputation and it's sort of just taken for granted whereas with women I don't think that's the case and I also wanted to get to the you know I've spoken to so many people who when we've been talking about language both men and women have said oh I only learn Russian because I fell in love with a Russian person or whatever you know and 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 yet when they're talking about you know when we see writing about language learning there's so little discussion of that like we, we see people writing about their romance but it's something very separate to, to language learning and for me I wanted to show both parts of those and show that there is no like this is the reality of it is that everything is scrunched together and there is no kind of at least for me, it felt like there was no on stage and backstage. It was all just one bit. And, and that was why it felt really important to do the sex stuff, which, you know, I'm aware, like, to some people might read as gratuitous um, or crass or whatever. But I sort of, like, that felt kind of important. Oh, definitely. And also there's, you know, like you said, I, it hadn't actually, the thought hadn't occurred to me, but when you said it, it really rang true that actually a lot of these sexual experiences are um, fairly still unique to a literature and would normally be portrayed from the other point of view and the woman would be nameless and important and fully defined and actually, um, I don't know, they was, I think there is something in um, how real they all felt to me you know they were familiar they were like yes I know what that's like I know what that's like like they it was like you could yeah I think that that was a really important thing to include as well I'm really glad you did <laughs> even though it can be hard yeah yeah I'm not the kind of you know Angela Carter style, like I had sex with this beautiful, wonderful, it was a wonderful experience. I'm saying, yeah, they're very, very, very much not like. <laughs> <laughs> they're also, um, you know, as you go through the book, your agency almost in these sexual encounters grows as well. And sort of your control over them, maybe not agency, but maybe also agency, you know, like there is a sense in which, um, you know, also as you, go through therapy and sort of understand who you are and how that plays into romantic relationships that comes up more and you also go um in therapy you also talk about like the sort of um 
denial you had that you would like as a teenager that you would never live in the UK and you'd always go somewhere else and more exciting and that is something actually I'm definitely grappling with right now as a my whole life I never conceptualized that I would be in the UK and sort of here I am <laughs> still in the UK and um I think it's a really hard thing and moving and sort of when it's right to move and when it's wrong to move and when sort of you're coming back to the UK is difficult when coming back to the UK is completely right I wonder if you want to speak about that yeah it's such a it's such a tricky one Issues, isn't it? And you know, I I went. I think it's not necessarily clear from this book, but my kind of trajectory is that I went to Japan when I was twenty one, stayed for a year and a half, then came back to the UK, did like a bunch of other things, and was in other countries for a while, and then kind of just before my thirtieth, just before I turned thirty. So to realize that basically I I wanted to go back to Japan. Like I, I didn't feel done there. And I think that like was partly personal and also partly professional, but it was sort of sort of becoming clear to me that I was gonna I wanted to be well, I was already becoming a literary translator and I wanted to stay doing that. And I felt like I didn't know enough culturally or linguistically to really do that as well as I wanted to be able to do it. So that was another reason. So I decided to go back out there kind of on the understanding, like, you know, it's a bit of a now or never thing of like, if I don't, I can just see that if I don't go now, I'm going to become more and more settled here. Yeah. Um, the and power it, of settling is so strong. <laughs> um, yeah. And also valid, like, you know, there is a reason, the things that make people's lives enjoyable are having friends and networks. And whenever you move, you lose all of that. And it does take years to build that up again. And I think I've had quite an itinerant, up until now, I've had quite an itinerant lifestyle. And I, I forget that each time almost, but it's like when you do get to a new place, okay, wow, now I have to start from scratch. And I think, you know, even coming back, when I came back, like, it was much easier because I was doing it in English. But it's still, you know, it's still, yeah, it's a long process. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. Like, there, there is nothing, there is nothing wrong with settling if that's what feels right. Um, but then it's also sometimes hard to know if that feels right if you haven't done the other bit, right? Um, and, you know, and I, like, I'm also aware that I'm in a position now of like, having done all this stuff, but it's, you know, in the past tense. And I, You know, I'm, I'm aware that that's a kind of overly, like that can be an overly comfortable position to be in. It's like, oh no, well, I've seen the world, but I've come back now and you know, everything is, it, I'm, I'm comfortable now. And I don't want to be that person. Like I don't, I want to continue to be changed by other things and, and not sink too much into the of it while at the same time I think like after going through this process of like therapy and just understanding more about myself and getting older I think I also have realized that like you know in order to feel sort of emotionally stable I do need some some degree of stability and support and and all of that and so yeah it's a, it's a big sorry that's not a very coherent answer it's a big jumble of ideas but I'm yeah I'm saying I'm saying I know exactly that <laughs> should I stay or should I go yeah and there's some degree in which your life is the same 
in either place like you still have to you know get up washed dressed eat <laughs> and, and I think sometimes like when we think of other places you miss out all of that um whereas obviously actually your life in some ways does always um yeah uh, represent the same things um I want to talk a little bit because this is a um as Fitzcarraldo tend to do um a definitely um very beautifully stylistic book and the writing is very nice and um was your um or oh, I I enjoy the style of writing a lot you know everyone sort of in whatever style people like is great but um was it a different what was the writing process like was the rhythm and tone there from the beginning and actually did you um when you won the prize had you done the book or was it then a matter of fulfilling Fitzcarraldo's deadline so the you, I'm sure you know, but just for anyone who's not aware of this, who's listening, the, uh, the essay prize that Fitzgerald won is you submit a proposal for a book length essay. Um, book length defined as, I think, over 30,000 words. Um, and you submit a proposal and then a sample. Um, and actually, I, I hadn't written the book. I decided to enter the essay prize pretty much because I've been sort of doing like since like after I came back from Japan, I was doing some jotting down around sort of these ideas. And I felt like writing this proposal would be a really good way of trying to consolidate my ideas, kind of more for myself, I think. Um but you know, obviously I was thinking, yeah, if I if I win and get a book contract with Fitzgerald, that would be the best thing in the world, but I, that wasn't what I was banking on happening. Um, and, um, and the writing, so then once I found out that I'd been given the prize, I actually was allowed to set my own deadline. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very much like, however long it takes, it's fine. I went to Italy, on the residency, which is kind of part of the, the prize. And I was there for almost three months. Um, and I drafted, I suppose, most of the book um, in that first three months, and then came back to the UK and kind of was hit with a translation bomb and did lots of translation and was sort of, the writing got sidelined a bit and then really, really returned to it. I suppose pretty much as the pandemic hit, actually. And um, yeah, just you know, redrafted and redrafted and redrafted until I was completely with it. Um, and it's funny because some bits of it, I think, are pretty much as they are. You know, I wrote them and then they more or less went in unchecked, and other bits have been through you know twenty different formulations um, and actually I think that most of the former are the sort of more more novelistic elements you know the, the bits that have been redrafted tend to be the kind of more theoretical stuff so I suppose which seems to, to, to suggest that um, it was quite free I, I did feel quite free you know I think I felt quite free writing. I also just felt quite, you know, it was so nice to write for Fitzcarraldo because I felt like it was okay to be mad and, you know, really like just sort of hit them with everything that I had. And I definitely felt that in shaping the proposal and then I felt it in writing the book. Um, and that was really liberating you know and I think I wouldn't say that as I was writing it I had no worries about what people would think because that would definitely be a lie but I wasn't I wasn't worried about kind of overstepping the mark in terms of like experimentalness and that was yeah sort of the best thing I think yeah, and um, with Fitzcarraldo, 
Um, with the blue covers, not so much of an issue. Um, with the white covers, um, <laughs> I can never keep them clean. Like I just get like, if I've like ha this like makeup on it and like, you know, a bit of paint on the back and stuff. Do you have any tips for keeping a Fitzcarraldo cover clean? How's yours faring? Well, I'm exactly the same as you. I'm the, the messiest book cover in the world because I often tend to like read while I'm eating as well. So it's, you know, the, like splashes of vinegar and things. My mum, sent me a picture <laughs> so i sent her her copy and i got this whatsapp message and i looked at it and it was a picture of just a book saying when i die and i was like what what why is she sending me this and then it was there was another one saying ta-da and it turned out that like she'd found that the cover of when i die was a perfect fit for 50 sounds so inside <laughs> inside was my book so you can repurpose covers from books of a similar size um I like that. That, yeah that's about all I have I'm afraid <laughs> I like that I do a lot. I like that I do a lot. That solves the debate, isn't it? I remember as like a, a kid, they were always a big it was always a big debate between like me and my siblings about whether you should keep those um oh what is the word for it now? You know, the removable covers, the the dust, dust, dust covers, dust yeah. jacket, that's it, yeah. About whether you should keep them on or not. And like some, you know, some that have really nice insides would get taken off and then <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> um did you sort of want to um is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to talk about to do with shame or um semi-fictionizing yourself or anything like that i don't think so i feel like i covered most of the things i, I feel like i've been talking <laughs> gibbering on for a very long time um no i don't think so in which case um I'd just like to say that um, I think this is a bit of an official book of the festival I think that for sort of anyone who is interested in um what sort of the conversations are about translation and language and learning a language like this is a book that explores them um so deeply I actually think I have a friend who is on who has been accepted pandemic allowing onto I think the government very same government scheme that you went on to <laughs> yeah and so I told her like you've got to read this you've got to read this yeah, and, yeah. and it, it's definitely a, um it's thoughtful and beautiful and um thank you very much and thanks for talking to me thank you it's been so nice and I really appreciate your questions not at all right um see the rest of you in another talk um you can support us on patreon if you are able find the rest of our talks on youtube and um see you all soon bye